All right, natural gas is a clean fossil fuel. Sierra listening? I realize they're my co-host, <clears throat> but we're friends and friends should be able to criticize each other. Uh, there's a version of this called natural gas is a cleaner fossil fuel. You've heard that one recently. Some of the ads that you're hearing on radio and TV, they've modified this because of research that we've been doing at Cornell. Oh, it's a cleaner fossil fuel. All right, so natural gas is a clean fossil fuel is a true statement. When you compare how much carbon dioxide is put into the atmosphere by burning mass equivalent, amount, mass equivalent amounts of coal, oil, and natural gas. Natural gas emits much less carbon dioxide per unit mass. So it's a true statement compared to coal and oil. And if you only talk about what happens when you burn it, and you only talk about carbon dioxide, that's a true statement. So should we ignore the rest of it? No. So why is this important? For those of you who don't believe in climate change, for those of you who don't believe in anthropogenic climate change, for the rest of you, listen. All right, another graph. Year, parts per million of carbon dioxide measured in the Earth's atmosphere. And as you can see by the black line, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere is increasing, as it has been for a while now. And it's increasing at about two parts per million per year. When the concentration of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere reaches about 450 parts per million, competent climate scientists say the Earth is in for really big trouble, because that's the rate, that's the, that's the concentration at which we would expect there to be runaway greenhouse gas effects on climate. We get all these negative feedbacks, uh, melting of permafrost, which releases more carbon monoxide, uh, carbon, uh, more methane, uh, melting of the polar ice caps, raising the sea level, warming of the ocean, which releases more carbon dioxide, and pretty soon things just go to hell in a handbasket. It's called instability. So if we're at 390 parts per million, and we're increasing at two parts per million per year, and we don't want to get to 450, how many years do we have left to do something about this? All of you who took calculus, this is not a differential <laughs> equation. 450 minus 390 is 60. 60 divided by 2 is, you got 30 years to do something about it. We don't have 100 years to do something about it. All right, what do we have to do? We have to decrease greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. What are the greenhouse gases? Carbon dioxide is a really bad greenhouse gas. A really worse greenhouse gas is methane. Natural gas is methane. This is year. This is parts per billion of methane in the Earth's atmosphere. Notice that up until the Industrial Revolution, it was fairly constant. Since the Industrial Revolution, it's been increasing rather drastically. So some people, like me, would point that as evidence of anthropogenic activity on greenhouse gases because humans, by burning fossil fuels, produce carbon dioxide, but we also produce lots of methane through industrial practices, agricultural practices, et cetera. Here's the important point. Unconventional gas development produces much more methane in the form of purposeful and accidental emissions than does conventional gas development. Conventional gas development, remember, a few tens of thousands of gallons of flowback. The flowback period is a few hours. On an unconventional well, three or four million gallons of flowback, Flowback period, 10 to, 10 to 15 days. During that flowback period, many companies just vent the gas into the atmosphere. Okay. We can talk about that. But all during the process of drilling and fracking, there are purposeful and accidental emissions of methane into the atmosphere. And here's the important point. Over a 20-year time period, how much time do we have left? 30 years. Over a 20-year time period, Methane is 105 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. So you take a volume of carbon dioxide and you take 1% of that and make it methane, and those two have the equivalent effect on global warming. Okay. We've got to decrease the amount of methane getting into the atmosphere. So let me show you one way that it goes. I'm going to show you a still photograph and then a video. This is a still photograph 
taken of a well that's being finished, that is, during the flowback period. Uh, this piece of heavy equipment is here for scale. Naked eye shows water vapor coming off the pad, but the naked eye can't see methane. Methane is colorless, odorless, tasteless. You can't see it with the naked eye, but as you saw in Gasland last night, if you have a FLIR camera and you tune the FLIR camera to the wavelength of absorption of hydrocarbons, you can see hydrocarbons. So I'm going to show you a video right now, and in this video, anything that you see is yellow is a hydrocarbon. So it's false color. But this is what you can't see with the naked eye. So in this case, the company chose not to use a reduced, a reduced emissions completion. They chose not to have a gathering line in place during flowback. They chose not to flare. Companies can do any of those three things, but each one has an economic cost associated with it and an environmental impact associated with it. They chose just to vent. Okay. And so that methane, um, millions of cubic feet per well, is going into the atmosphere. And there's the piece of equipment just to give you a scale. This isn't just a little puff. These are billowing clouds of methane. All right, other end of the spectrum. The methane comes out of the ground. Eventually, it goes into a pipeline, it goes into a compressor station. Compressor stations leak and are purposely vented to control pressure. Then it goes into a transmission gas line, high pressure, long distance, uh, large diameter pipelines. Then it goes to city gates, where it is unpressurized, sent into distribution lines, which are under all the city streets. So how many of you here live in Bethlehem or Allentown or Easton and you're on natural gas? OK, how does it get to your house? Through small diameter, low pressure pipes that have been underground for 50 years or more. And they leak. So this is recent work done by our colleague at Boston University. Here's a map of downtown Boston. What he does is gets in his truck and drives up and down the streets. And he has effectively a sniffer, a very high-tech sniffer that can, can, that can very accurately measure methane flux. And as he runs up and down the streets, he makes a record of how much methane there is in the atmosphere. And so the background level is two parts per billion. Two parts per billion is anything that you see here. Anything greater than two parts per billion are the spikes. So he has measured a hundred times, a thousand times normal background level. So there are tens of thousands of leaks under the streets of Boston, tens of thousands of leaks under the streets of New York, Chicago, LA, all of our major cities. And um, it costs a lot of money to fix them. In the meantime, all that methane is going to the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas, and without spending too much more time in another bar chart. Uh, this is our estimate at Cornell of the effect of both burning the stuff and its effect on methane emissions, the stuff being shale gas, conventional gas, coal, diesel oil. The higher the bar, the worse. So this is the carbon dioxide that's emitted. That's the black. Blue is the carbon dioxide emitted through all the equipment that's necessary to get the stuff out of the ground. Uh, the pink is methane emissions. And so we have a lower estimate and an upper estimate. Our lower estimate makes unconventional gas dirtier than coal or oil. And the industry doesn't like to say us, does not like us to say that. And they're doing everything they can to discredit us personally and discredit our science. And yet every paper that's appeared in the last couple of months seems to support what we predicted. Of course, there are the papers that come out from certain places that are not peer reviewed or places that come out from peer reviewed journals from scientists who are supported directly by the gas industry that seem to take uh, offense of our science, but that is what it is. Okay, last graph, and this is probably the most important thing I'm gonna leave you with today. So I'm gonna spend a full couple minutes making sure you understand it. This is a graph that appeared in uh, the most recent issue of Science Magazine, which as you know is the single most prestigious peer-reviewed journal in all of science. And it was authored by uh, Drew Schindel, who's a scientist at NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Sciences, uh, authors from NOAA, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, and seven or eight other authors from around the world, all very prestigious climate scientists. This is year from 1900 to 2070, and this is the change in the average Earth temperature over some baseline. And the International Panel on Climate Control 
an element of the United Nations, has declared that as a baseline, we're going to use the period 1890 to 1910. So they averaged the Earth atmosphere over that 20-year period and called that baseline. So that would be zero. So since 1900, this is a record of average Earth temperature. So in 2010, the average Earth temperature had risen by about 0.9 degrees centigrade over the baseline. If you extrapolate, just a straight linear extrapolation, you get purple. So they have these very complex computer models that say, all right, if our computer model can explain this, then we will use the computer model to tell us what will happen in the future if we do absolutely nothing. No cap and trade. No control on carbon dioxide, no control on methane, no control on black carbon. Business as usual, drill, baby, drill, burn, burn, burn. What you need to know is that when we get to two degrees centigrade, that's when all hell breaks loose. That's the 450 parts per million of carbon dioxide. That's when we have all the negative feedbacks, runaway global warming. That's what the scientists say. So you never want to get above two. Warning is at one and a half. This is like the yellow light, this is the red light. So business as usual, 2000, 2010, 2020, somewhere around 2030, hopefully most of us will still be alive, we're in bad shape if we don't do anything. All right, so there are various computer models that say, well, wait a minute, what's the most important thing, the most cost-effective thing, the most immediately possible thing that we should do to try to delay that? Well, we should start doing everything to decrease the burning of fossil fuels, all of them. That's a given. But if you want to delay this, you can delay it by up to 20 years if you decrease methane and black carbon being emitted into the atmosphere. That would be this curve right here. So if you're going to spend money to do something quickly, spend money to decrease methane emissions and black carbon emissions. Well, black carbon emissions comes from burning really bad stuff um, that produces soot. How do you decrease methane emissions? Stop. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Stop production of unconventional natural gas from shales because unconventional natural gas from shales is the single most prevalent, present source of methane emissions, and it's happening where first? What is the United States now proudly displaying to the rest of the world? Exactly the wrong example. So, we're not supposed to be doing any kind of lobbying today. <laughs> but I think you know where that goes. Obviously, the right thing to do is everything we possibly can do to decrease carbon dioxide and methane and black carbon. And the best computer models now take us here, which means we get into the danger zone, the yellow zone, but not into the deathly zone, death zone, we think. But just to make things really depressing for you, these bars over here are the so-called error bars. That is, the scientists now claim that, well, we don't know for sure, right? It's just a computer model. We're extrapolating into the future. There's so many variables we're not sure about. So we can say there's a very high certainty that if we do everything we can starting today, we could be here, or we could be here, or we could be here. In other words, it can already be too late. In other words, we have con committed since the late, nine, eight, late, eight, late 1700s repeated generational energy greed without foresight into what we were doing to future generations. We took it all for ourselves and burned it. And that's what we're doing right now, committing another generational greed. And I'm part of it, and you're part of it. So what do we do? Well, <laughs> that's why we're here, right? <laughs> Um, I would point out that as of this week, the Pen Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Preservation said, okay, the EPA has now imposed federal regulations that require all operators in the United States to report all their gaseous emissions. First time ever, 2012. So nobody in P Pennsylvania DEP or nobody in New York DEC said, you know what, we ought to be measuring these emissions. Maybe those guys from Cornell are right. Maybe those people from Boston University are right. Maybe those people from NOAA and University of Colorado are right. There's a lot of stuff getting emitted. We better start measuring it. Okay, so it, it, the, the states 
are saying, we are in control. We don't need federal regulation. We know what we're doing, but none of the states thought this up. It's the EPA that is now imposing on the states a requirement that the operators starting on December 31st, 2011, must report all their gaseous emissions. And DEP said, well, we can't do it in time, so we're gonna ask all the operators to start submitting their reports by mid-year, actually by March the 31st. So next week, for the first time in the history of oil and gas development in the state of Pennsylvania, operators are gonna be required to report all gaseous emissions from well sites and compressor stations. Still leaves all the pipeline stuff. So it's about time, but it took the federal regulations to get that done. And by the way, the industry fought these regulations tooth and nail. Some of, the, some of the industry, some of the companies actually took EPA to court and said, no, we don't want this. Typical. All right, um, so that was the myth. Natural gas is a clean fossil fuel, it's not. Um, final comments. Why is high volume fracking from long laterals a higher risk to human health? Clustered pads, multi wells, number of wells and volume of waste increase, probability of accidental releases of hazardous materials into the air and groundwater increases. No one yet knows the cumulative effects of this new technology, this new industry in a region, say statewide. Uh, and the increased production, processing, storage, compression, dehumidification, and pipeline transport of this stuff results in the exacerbation of climate change. And if you want more reliable information, then here are two places that I suggest you go. Um, so we organized our own website a couple of years ago, pscehealthyenergy.org, only high quality vetted information on this website. And you probably all know about the oil and gas accountability project out of Earthworks. Uh, those would be my two recommendations for places that you go for more high quality information. Neither of these are blog sites. Neither of these are publishing stuff which is uh, anonymous. So thank you all very much. I hope I don't go too far over time. I really appreciate your attending today and look forward to your questions. Thank you.